Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. It's a pleasure to talk about CarpetX. I'm going to give a presentation explaining how to use CarpetX and some of the basic concepts there. And this is meant for early adopters. It's almost ready for production use. There's one feature that isn't there yet, and that is checkpointing recovery. Apart from that, you could, should be able to use it. So this presentation has two parts. In the beginning, a bit of an overview of what is in CarpetX and some basic concepts. And the second part, a bit more hands-on in the sense I'm showing some actual code and walk you through writing your own thorn that uses CarpetX, pointing out the differences to Carpet. So, and the basics, CarpetX is a new driver for the Einstein Toolkit. It's based on AMREX. And when we started out with the project, we had hopes to get the following features from Carpet AMREX. First, AMREX has many users, it's independently funded. So we benefit from their development, don't have to do everything ourselves. It provides cell-centered, face-centered, vertex-centered grids, etc. proper refluxing. This is very good for hydrodynamics. Currently, I hear the people who do big hydro simulations don't like to have mesh refinement boundaries inside a star because it leads to large errors. The hope is that refluxing makes this possible because it has much less error than refinement boundaries when there's, for example, a shock wave going through that. It supports AMR based on local criteria, so you don't need to say where you put your boxes, rather you say which error each cell has, and then depending on a threshold, AMREX refines or doesn't refine. It has support for accelerators, for example, CUDA, but also three or four other things. And that, of course, is interesting for us. There are elliptic solvers built in, and that has long been missing from the Einstein toolkit. Eloisa Bentivenia worked on that, but for some reason, her work hasn't been picked up. Maybe that gives that another boost. And AMREX is scalable. It supports exascale. That's what the X in AMREX is about. So let's see what's that about. And we had two other goals in the project. And the first is to simplify the scheduling. If you have a mesh refinement code and a schedule, then you say which routines happen at time, global mode, level mode, local mode, etc. It's quite easy to get confused and to make an errors. Errors are not often detected. You have some undefined points, difficult to track down. We wanted to be much more rigorous about that. And IO performance also was a bit of a problem in particular I'm, for I'm recovery. Sorry. Yes. I'm sorry. Sorry. Um, just a minute. Peter, are you recording this? Did you hit record? Yes, Peter is recording. I heard the message earlier. At the moment, he was muted. There's, the there's a tag on the top left. Hmm. OK, all right. Oh, yes, I see it now. All right, sorry. <laughs> uh, Very good. Thank you. So this is the current state of affairs. The green things are working, independently funded. Well, they have funding. They're collaborating with us. They're happy to do so. They're self-face, vertex-centered grids, et cetera, refluxing. We tested that with a simple non-relativistic hydrothon. So this is all done and simplify the scheduling, preventing errors and so on. That is all working beautifully. Mm. Other things are still work in progress. For example, AMR based on local criteria. Well, all the AMR itself works. The question is what kind of refinement criteria you actually want to apply. And since our community doesn't have much experience with that, I'll keep that in blue in progress uh, instead of marking it as green as a self thing. Support for accelerators. So this was the last feature that we worked on in the past weeks. So we can run, solve the Einstein equations on a GPU. That works fine. And it's the same code that runs efficiently on a CPU and runs on a GPU. So that's all good, but it's not yet properly optimized for a GPU. So that's still work in progress. And elliptic solvers. The problem there is that, I mean, it works nice. I was able to solve the Poisson equation, but they only support second order stencils, no fourth order stencils. And it seems to be difficult to modify their code. You probably have to rewrite a whole lot of operators to do that. Also work in progress. Exascale scaling, I ran with Carpet X on up to 1500 cores. That worked nicely, no problem there. But 1500 isn't interesting. You want to have at least 10 times as many cores to be interesting and at least a hundred times as many to actually be interesting. And that still needs to be tested. I don't expect any fundamental problem there. And improving IO performance. So uh, we have of course a new file format that comes with AMREX and uh, uh, it, it should be more efficient, but also that hasn't really been tested at scale. So what else is working today in CarpetX? 
I just mentioned, we have IO both based on HDR5 and ASCII IO. You can read and write HDR5 file. It's using the silo format. That's the native format for visit. And uh, checkpoint recovery is not working yet. That's the big thing that's missing from IO. We have reductions in interpolations, but no hyperslabbing. Amrex itself, the library, doesn't support hyperslabbing, so we have to work around that. The symmetries, priority boundaries, and reflecting symmetries, but no rechoting symmetries yet. They require hyperslabbing, and there's no hyperslabbing in Amrex. And we are working on that. Uh, adaptive mesh refinement works with higher order, prolongation and restriction, cell, vertex centered, face centered, edge centered, anything you want should all work. We able to run a wave toy, a basic scalar wave, of course, that's nice. There's a hydro toy, the basic non-relativistic Euler equations, testing all the hydro stuff. And we can run the Einstein equations, although they haven't been simply parallelized. So I expect them to be slower than the respective McLaughlin code. <clears throat> And I hope your mouth is watering. And uh, the main point of this presentation is get you interested in actually trying it out and giving feedback and making sure that all the work is actually useful. So here I want to show a movie. I know showing a movie is always a bit of a problem in Zoom. Let's just see how it goes. This is just the QZ0 simulation. You see two black holes moving in. They'll do three quarters of an orbit before merging. The, I'm showing the labs. In the beginning, the labs changes because the gauge conditions adapt. They move around. Yeah, there's no horizon finder in that run and no wave extraction. I'm sorry. Right about now, the black holes would merge. You don't see that. And there's a final black hole. And the simulation continues on a bit further. That should be a fully fourth order simulation. And I, the parameter file says the finest resolution is 1 over 24. The coarse resolution is 1. That doesn't make sense because it's supposed to be a power of two, but uh, whatever. So that is a nice proof that things actually work smoothly, but there's things to do. But I, mean, I would like to show Psi4 though, the wave, of course, not just the lab's function. Yep. So now to the changes between carpet and carpet X regarding adaptive mesh refinement. Carpet X does not yet support subcyclic in time. When we started designing Carpet X, there was a lot of doubt in the carpet community whether subcycling in time is worth the effort. A, it makes the scheduling much more complicated. It is really expensive, what with buffer zones and everything and stability and time interpolation is only second order accurate. And if you have a rather small refined region near a black hole, it's really difficult to obtain scalability because with subcycling, each level needs to be distributed over the processes independently because it's serialized. So we started without subcycling in time. That is uh, much more efficient. It is really scalable. It is much simpler. And uh, everything happens at the same and prolongation and restriction happen when synchronizing. All the levels are evolved at the same time. So it's beautiful and scalable. I just wonder whether it's actually slower in the end because now you need to evolve the core script much more often. Anyway. We are planning to add subcycling in time in the future, but at the moment it's not a priority. At the moment we want to push it towards doing some real physics first. Regridding is different. Instead of specifying where the boxes go, uh, you define for every grid cell what the local error is, and you choose a threshold. And Carpet X splits the domain into eight by eight blocks, and every block that where the error is too large, that is going to be refined up to the maximum level that you specify. And uh, yeah, how to choose the local error, that's up to you when you write your thorn, when you write your evolution system. There are several ideas. I don't want to talk about it here, but we can just discuss the ideas later if necessary. Also, there are no multi-block systems available yet that can be added in the future. Mm. Uh, right now, I want to show a bit of a code look walking through the interface.ccl. I'm going to switch my screen. I have to get out of full screen mode here and open. A... Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't prepare the window that I want to show. Please give me a minute while I open an Emacs window where I can show you the code. And now I want to share something different. I assume you're not seeing an Emacs window. And right there, I'm going to show a thorn called WaveToy CPU and the interface CCL. 
a quick check that the font is large enough. If not, I expect you to speak up. Very good. So the interface to CCL uh, looks slightly simpler than with carpet. Uh, one thing I didn't mention before that the Thorn method of lines is quite tightly coupled to the driver. So at the moment, there is a new version of MOL called ODE solvers that we're using that can be fixed later. And it's more tightly integrated with the driver and uses a more modern thing. So you don't need to register grid functions in the beginning to see what is evolved or not. Rather, you can add a tag to the grid function. And let's say for this group, the group is called state. There are right-hand side variables in a group called right-hand side, which is that group down here. And that tells the time integrator that that state group should be evolved in time and that this is the respective right-hand side routine. It's a simple thing and it's all written down here in the interface as it should be when more was designed, maybe the tags mechanism didn't exist yet. Also, you see that there are, we don't declare any time levels because we don't need any time levels. The time integrator allocates uh, its temporary storage automatically, knows how to do that. But there's just the current time level and everything else happens in the time integrator. And the last thing that you see here is this index statement. Carpet X, because of AMREX, supports cell-centered, face-centered, blah, blah, blah variables. So you need to specify what kind of centering you have. And uh, that means in each direction, uh, well, 111 just means cell centering. Zero, zero, zero would be vertex centering. Uh, yeah, for historic reasons, this is a cell-centered uh, wave toy. If I voted today, it would be vertex centered. The code would be very similar. And I think the fault is vertex centered if you don't specify the index, but why not specify it? And if you have a hydrothon, then of course you want to specify the evolved variables are cell centered. The fluxes are face centered. So you set one of these to zero and the respective thing and the respective directions it becomes. So, face centered and uh, that's that's about it here and there is this loop thing that simplifies looping over grid functions because of other additional features that carpet x has that uh, i'll describe later oh and there is another tag here checkpoint equals no this essentially means the variable is not checkpointed that that's a fancy way of saying that this is not part of the state vector so the state vector is essentially consists of all variables that are checkpointed. Maybe we should rename it. Initially, it was introduced to not checkpoint any variables that you didn't want to. But at the moment, we should have tags here in the interface declaring which variables are part of the state vector and what not. We are not there yet. Eric, now, now might be a good time to ask, do we do edge centered or does that even make sense for Einstein toolkit? It does. It does make sense. Uh, you don't needed for hydrodynamics, but we also played with the Maxwell equations. I give up because I don't know enough about the Maxwell equations to, to give it stable, but there you want edge-centered variables. And if you have magnetic fields, then, then you also want edge-centered. And I think edge-centers have a single one and two zeros, and that single one then says in which direction the edge goes. You have x, y, and z axis. <clears throat> And that is all supported by AMREX and we are higher order prolongation restriction operators for all of these. Okay. Let me switch back to the presentation. It's going to be forth and back. Uh, sorry, quick question on that. Uh, is there also a sort of uh, finite volume, uh, for example, mm, with all prolongation and so take into account that it's an average over a cell or is there just point-wise operate? Um, uh, that is what I call cell-centered. Cell-centered operators are the finite volume operators. Uh, that means everything is an average over a cell and uh, restriction and prolongation take this into account. So if you restrict on vertices, then of course you want to have a nice curve when you interpolate in between. And if you restrict uh, cell-centered or face-centered values, then you need to make sure that the integral, the sum over the cells also matches. That gives you one additional condition. So the order of interpolation is one lower and that is built into the respective operators. So to my knowledge, the cell centering and face centering is exactly what you want for hydro, but please tell me that I'm wrong if I'm wrong about that. So what if I'm not doing hydro and want to do really cell centered finite differences without uh, dealing with finite volume? Uh, that, 
okay, that might also be possible. That's also possible. There are different kinds of stencils. Uh, what you just described is, I think, what I implemented first. And, and then there's a second set of stencils with different names that do the thing. And I tried to make everything possible. I also tried to implement kind of vertex centered with the averaging, but I couldn't make it work. I think it's inconsistent. You can't really make that work. So that doesn't work. So th these three cases are supported. There's vertex centered with interpolation, there's cell centered with interpolation and cell centered with averaging. And I didn't think that someone actually wanted to do the second case you just mentioned, the cell centered with interpolation. I was actually thinking of taking it out, just to get around to doing it yet. I can keep it in. Now about adaptive mesh refinement, uh, more details. I mentioned it does not yet support subcycling in time. So if you want to do binary black holes with a refinement stack of 10 or 15 levels, that's probably not the time yet to do that with this infrastructure. All the levels advance simultaneously and that of course makes it much more efficient and much more scalable. You don't need buffer zones for everything. That's also a big advantage. And I also mentioned that restriction happens when you synchronize. That's a change from carpet. With subcycling, you restrict at a very well-defined point in time. You evolve the cost grid, you evolve the fine grid to the same time. And once they're at the same time, that's when you restrict from fine to coarse. And in carpet X, every time you synchronize, you fix the boundaries as well. And you also fix the interior of the coarse grids by restricting. There's a flag for that, you can switch that off, but I think the current default is good, but it's not quite clear whether that's actually true. Regridding, this, uh, did I show this slide again? Is this a copy that I inadvertently made? made? I might have done that. It all sounds very familiar. You define the local error for, cell, for every cell, so it's a grid function that Carpet X provides, and in that grid function, you fill it with the error for every cell that you have, and you define a threshold, and then, then uh, Carpet X so the AMREX would actually refine it correspondingly. And there are two ways of thinking about this. One is that you define an error for every cell and then have an error threshold. And depending on that threshold, you define whether to refine or not. And another way to thinking about it is that you have a length scale in your physics and you need to capture that length scale. So you want to compare that length scale with the current grid spacing. And uh, you could get a length scale, for example, by taking uh, some physical field and taking a derivative, the absolute value of the gradient would give you a length scale. So you could take that, define it by, a, sorry, you divide that absolute value of the gradient by a typical value for the grid. And then you get the length scale and then you compare that to the length scale of the current level. And then you know whether you're fine or not. And depending on that, you're fine or not. And that should be I think, more physical accurate, but I don't know what fudge factors you need in there. I hope that other people who are familiar with other frameworks, I of course am mostly familiar with carpet, have ideas there and can teach us how to do that. I was going back in time. <laughs> That's why I showed this slide again. I am so embarrassed. Please tell me these things. Is no one of you watching the page numbers? Okay, yeah, this is what I actually wanted to talk about now. Scheduling. Scheduling is slightly simpler. So when you set up initial conditions, it actually initial conditions are set up in a loop. The cost grid is initialized, then it sets up initial conditions there. And then it evaluates the refinement criteria. And if there's refinement needed, things are refined and the initial conditions are rerun until no more refinement is needed. And in the end, as usual, you run post-step analysis and output on all the levels. And evolution runs in a similar way. Well, if unless you are done, first you regret, and then you run post-regret, et cetera, to initialize the new levels. Then you evolve. Post-step analysis output is the same for initial condition. That's the general way. And uh, now the, the next slide is going to be a bit technical. You might use it as a reference. There are these kind of bins, and here I describe what the important scheduling bins are called and what you're supposed to be supposed to be doing in this scheduling bin. In base grid, that's a good place to set up constant data, for example, coordinates. Uh, yeah, if you have a regular grid, there's not much point in actually storing the coordinates, but uh, you would do that. And base grid is rerun when a new level is created, but nothing is evolved in there. Initial and post initial, that's when you initialize the state vector and also apply boundary conditions, etc., on it. 
And when I say boundary conditions, I mean you synchronize, prolongate, restrict, outer boundary, and so on. So they're all grid points are defined when you come out of initial and post initial. And in the evolution bin, they evolve the state vector and apply boundary conditions, et cetera, and so forth. And of course, if you use ODE solvers or thorn mole or something, that schedule its evolution in this able bin where it does the Rummel Kutta cycles there. In post step and analysis, that's where you calculate quantities that don't influence the evolution. For example, you evaluate constraints, horizons, wild scalars there, and so on. And this is also where you define the local error for regridding for the time evolution. Because after the post step bin, I mean, things go back in time to the beginning of the evolution. And that's when it looks at things for where things should be regretted. And post step is also run when you recover, once recovering is implemented. After recovering data, it runs post step and thus chooses whether you want to refine before starting the evolution. And there's a post regret bin where you need to reapply the boundary conditions. Uh, CoverDex doesn't know what fields should have what boundary conditions. So you need to synchronize, prolongate, restrict, apply the outer boundary conditions there, and so on. Next, I want to show you the schedule of WaveTrace CPU. I'm going to switch over to my Emacs, pushing the wrong button. No, sorry, push the wrong button here. Let's look at the schedule here. And uh, yeah, you see in the beginning, there are no storage statements here. That's just because storage management isn't implemented yet. We allocate storage for all variables all the time. It's quite convenient. In the future, someone needs to fix that, of course. Uh, first, I define scheduled groups that do particular things at the necessary times. There's an initial group, which is scheduled at initial. There's this post step group, which is one at post initial and at post regret. That's where the wave toy will apply boundary condition. It's also run in ODE solvers post step. That's corresponding to more post step. And there's the right hand side group, which is scheduled in ODE solvers right hand side, corresponds to more right hand side. Oh, and there's an analysis group that runs at analysis. I think I calculated the error and the energy there. And then the other things are just scheduled in the respective group. There are initial conditions, synchronization, boundary conditions after synchronization. And oh, I don't know. I hope you know about these things already. But each routine declares, needs to declare which grid functions it accesses, the reads and writes statement. Uh, I don't know how familiar you are with it. It's supported in the basic Einstein toolkit, but it's not yet compulsory. At the moment, it is compulsory to use these features in Carpet X. So you have to add these annotations. So this initialized routine writes the interior of phi and psi. And the driver actually keeps track of that and flags errors. And synchronization, it synchronizes the state group. And of course, synchronization expects these things to be valid interior and fills it in in the ghost zones. And the boundary condition routine here that reads the state in the interior and writes the state on the boundary. And there are other things here. Oh, here's an error estimator. This is the thing that actually estimates the local regreeding error. So it reads the interior of the state vector and writes this regreed error, this error estimate in the interior that's a variable in carpet X. And then of course the right hand side routine does exactly what you expect. It reads phi and psi everywhere and calculates the right hand side in the interior. Let's scroll down a bit. Then I apply synchronize the right hand side and apply boundary conditions to the right hand side. I think they're just set to zero, so it doesn't read anything, it just writes them. And at the very bottom of the file, there's the energy which reads it everywhere. Energy depends on derivatives and writes the interior of the energy and synchronizes it. That means we don't have boundary values for the energy. Anyway, they're probably not necessary. And error calculate, because I have an analytic solution, I also want to calculate the error just for cross-checking. So it reads the state vector everywhere Eric? and writes these five values everywhere. Yes? There's a question in the, um, in the uh, chat. OK. Um, uh, let's see, where did it go? OK, I opened a chat. It was the after clauses needed or can they be derived from reads and writes? And uh, the after clauses are needed. They cannot yet be derived from reads and writes. 
The schedule is managed in the flash. So this is not handled by the driver. So the driver doesn't actually derive any of these after statements. The driver only detects inconsistencies, which is kind of a good first step, but it's obvious that you'd want the latter as well. Good. Let me go back to the presentation. So these dependencies in the schedule, that was actually the work in Carpet X was just piggybacking on other work that happened in the flesh and in other places before by other people. I just, when I began to develop Carpet X, I confused myself. I, I thought it was important. I thought it would be a nice thing to have, but I realized it's absolutely necessary because I, I, I mean, with all the indexing, cell-centered vertex, vertex standard, not understanding what Armrex does, routing a new code, I got so many sec faults and undefined values they're just out of self-defense uh, that I implemented all these scheduling clauses and I made it almost watertight. So uh, there's a lot of checking going on. So the basic idea is, and you should know that from other discussions in the flash, that each scheduled function needs to declare which parts of which variables it reads or writes. And of course, regretting, synchronization, prolongation, and so on, they're handled by the driver. There, the driver notes, knows which is read and what it written, and it can also do this checking. And the driver checks the consistency and flags errors. So it keeps internally track of which part of what variable is defined. And if some undefined part is needed, then that would be an error. But that's not the only thing it does, because the driver also checks whether the declarations is correct. First, of course, if a grid function if a scheduled function say it does not access a particular variable, that variable isn't declared in the source code. That's not something CarpetX does. That's also done by the flash, implemented by other people. So that's that. If a function, a grid function is only read and not written, it's declared const. So there's an error message from the compiler. If something is undefined, then the driver actually sets it to none, to not a number, and I mean, debug mode only because that's expensive. And uh, thus, if a thorn accesses it, that, that would be detected. And after the function return, everything that's defined is checked whether it is still none. It's supposed to be not none. So if something is you forget to set a particular grid point, the driver can detect it. And it goes even one step further. It checksums the parts of the variables that uh, func scheduled function promises not to touch. So if the function says, I'm setting the interior and it accidentally sets a boundary point or a ghost point as well, the driver would detect that as well and report an error as well. So it's not quite watertight, if the, but uh, it's very close there. And the driver also keeps track of which scheduled routine on what level at what iteration changes the state. So if something is inconsistent, you get an error message is probably 10 lines long. And that says, oh, I need the ghost zones of this function to be valid, but they are invalid because three iterations ago, there was this regridding and the regridding only set the interior and so therefore flag the outer boundary to invalid. And that helps you debug these things. So it's still some sleuthing necessary if the Scheduling isn't right, but most problems are actually detected. And it's way, way better than sec faults or tracking down uninitialized points or weird things. So I, I like I like that a lot. It helped me a lot. And this is also why it's still necessary you've, you've got, to pep that. You've got another question in the uh, chat. Okay. I'm opening the chat. How are Interior and boundary points, this was always tricky to pin down. So a domain consists of three pieces, their interior points, boundary points, and ghost points. And the whole domain setup is a bit simpler than what Carpet and the Flash supports, also because of what comes from Amrex. So you define a domain, and that defines the interior of the domain. And then every grid has kind of a layer, a corona of, of what you call it a layer of ghost points added. And uh, if there is another grid nearby, it's a ghost point. And if it's near the outer boundary and you don't have any superty condition, then it's called the boundary. And, and that's that. And it's rather straightforward in this case. Halo, thank you. It's called a halo. And uh, of course, there are slight inconsistencies because you could be in a corner and then it's an outer boundary point and also a ghost point. 
and that's still a bit fishy what happens there i think uh, if something needs to be valid i don't recall exactly how it's handled but, but when you loop over points then you can loop say you loop over outer boundary points with or without ghosts so that is that is checked there but for the validity i think it just is a bit uh, careful if if it's both an outer point and a ghost point, synchronization would set it. But if you don't set it in a routine, that's fine. If you say you set the outer pointer points and the boundary and ghost points, you don't need to set them or something. It, it, yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> but so. Before we get into more detail, I want to show a parameter file before actually showing the code. I want to show you the parameter file for a plane wave. So let me switch over to that. It is this one here. So, okay. The thorns, you need carpet X. You, there is no carpet X lib or similar because that's just MREX and MREX is activated automatically. That's simpler. ODE solvers, I mentioned, that's the new version of MOL. Who knows whether they'll be merged in the future. And of course, the actual wave type CPU run. Uh, since some time ago, you can have variables in parameter files. We start with the dollar sign. That's just to keep things consistent. So this is an important parameter here, precinct mode, mixed error. Carpet X requires that. This precinct mode is the schedule checking that for historical reason, it's called precinct because the basic idea was that Cactus should be able to figure out by itself when to synchronize variables and we're not, not there yet. But I don't recall what mixed error means, but it means if there's an inconsistency, you get an error. Then you define the number of cells. Uh, Amrex likes to be cell-centered. So everything is done in number of cells. And if a vertices, vertices sit at the edges of cells. So if your domain is not periodic, you have one more vertices than edges. So here we have 16 cells on the cost grid. And the thing is cell-centered. So it actually the grid is 16 cubed plus ghost zones. But if it was vertex-centered, the cost grid would be 70 cubed plus the boundary zones on the outside. And how many do we have? I don't know whether it's declared. There is no declaration. Oh, yeah, I think the default is one ghost zone. So the grid is probably 18 cubed. Then. There are a few other parameters that you can set, but that's a simple example. That's not there. The maximum number of levels, we grid every, oh, I was debugging yesterday. Okay, I set it to one to trigger the error. 16 is a good choice. And that's the error threshold. And I'll just choose one. I mean, that also depends on how you define what the error is. Generic Bruno Kutta integrator with the CFL factor, the initial condition and uh, output. Can you see something here? Yeah, uh, I output all the variable in the CIDO format. Okay, that is a rather simple parameter file. Let's look a bit one that's a bit more complicated from the QZ0 case from the, from the Zeta 4C system that we have here. That, that yeah, a bit longer as you see. Well, it's an RPAR file. So there's a bit of fluff in the beginning, the Python script that generates it. Yeah, there's nothing interesting to see here. Again, precinct mode. Uh, oh, I switched off poisoning and so on. That makes it much faster. It disables much of the checking. It still checks the metadata, but it doesn't check the individual grid points. Obviously that, that would be expensive, the checking and so on. This defines the domain X min and x max chooses the domain size. It just tells Amrex about it. And I think here it's minus 128 to 128. And this is the size of the domain that is the lower boundary of the first cell to the higher upper boundary of the last cell, excluding boundaries. It's just the domain. And then we have, I think, 256 cells. So each cell has a size of one. Uh, it's a clean thing. Then we can define a tile size. I'm going to describe that a bit later. This has to do with the OpenMP parallelization. It's now more efficient in Carpet X than in Carpet. And it's also due to AMREX. Essentially, each local grid 
that used to be called component in carpet is split into tiles of that size. So that's a large number that's actually not split in the X direction, but split in the other direction. And uh, each OpenMP thread works on one of these tiles at a time. That is a better way to split things onto OpenMP threads to make it more efficient. Then for <laughs> historic reasons, uh, priority boundaries are actually the default. So I switched them off here. And apparently you need these four statements to switch them off. They're rather light to be on. I also don't have any reflection boundaries and that, well, that just become outer boundaries. The ghost size is three. It also sets the boundary size. There's no distinction here. I think in most cases that's not necessary. Some regridding parameters. <clears throat> error estimator. Yeah, I don't know how to have a good error master. So it's these fake error estimator that just does the same thing as carpet regret two. Uh, you, you just put cubes in cubes and it sets the grid functions correspondingly. I think it just uses one over R fall off and that gives you something similar to cubes with cubes. And if your cubes get really large, the corners get cut off. Here choose the prolongation type. DDF is the good type that I mentioned that is interpolating for vertex centered and averaging for cell centered. The other ones as well. Order five requires three ghost zones. And then the usual thing is just uh, two punctures and everything. For performance reasons, you can switch off calculating the ADM variables or the right-hand side of the stuff that is stored in ADM base and calculating the constraints here. It's all on because I actually want that for debugging. Some set of C parameters and some output parameters. Oh, no, that was too much here. Sorry. We put the output parameters on the screen. Out mode NP means every that many processes output. So you can say that not every MPI process outputs, but only every 10 or 100. And the other processes would send their data to the nearest IO process using the fast infinite network. And that process then dumps the data to disk. Whether that's faster or slower depends on how fast the network you have and how fast the file system is. So here I'm running on our local system and we have a GPFS file system and it can easily handle all that output. So it's fastest if every process outputs. But if you need to write to NFS, or if you write on 10,000 processes, I'm sure that will come in handy. Out plot file. Oh yeah, MREX has its own output format called plot file that generates a lot of files. I actually run out of disk quota, not because of space, because it, it generated a million output files when I wanted to make a movie. I don't know, it's per iteration, per level, per variable, per grid or something. And in the end, it was just no happiness. So I'm not using that anymore. There's this silo format that comes from visit. It's well documented. It uh, stores the grid structure and the individual variables based on HD5 because the layout is different than once. And there I output some variables, the ADM bias variables, the while scalers and something else down here. Oh yeah, kind of the, the, the sum of all constraints, the RMS of all the constraints to check the evolution. ASCII output, it's now called TSV, top separated values. Tab separator values are a, a generalization or a version of CSV comma separated values. And CSV is the generic file format for data. So if anyone is doing any kind of data science, you get any kind of data. I mean, you either need to scrape them out of an HTML page or they come in CSV format. And anything can read that. I mean, Python, Julia, GNU plot, MATLAB, Mathematica, Anything can read that. So this is now our file format. And it just puts separates the value by tabs. So Nublot can also still read it. And timer report. Hmm. Is there anything else I wanted to mention? Oh, yes, there are a few other things I wanted to mention. I didn't find them in here. So let's go back to the slide. Hmm. Or should I describe that later? Yes, I'll describe that. I'll go to the next slides. So I mentioned tiling earlier. This is the new OpenMP parallelization. These pictures are taken from the AMREX documentation. And here you have some coarse grid in white and the find grid with two grids on it, two components as carpet would call it. And I have a particular size. And uh, in 
carpet the open MP parallelization would work as follows. It loops serially over these two components. And then each of these components would be broken up into individual pieces by open MP, but there's still this serial loop over the components. And in carpet X, it's more efficient. It chooses a particular tile size here, four squared, and breaks all the grids up. And then you end up with eight tiles. And all these eight tiles are open and be parallelized at the same time. So the advantage is there are more tiles, there's more parallelism, it's more efficient. And the disadvantage is that a scheduled routine runs only over a single tile. Well, that's not a disadvantage. The disadvantage is that this is different than the way it used to be before. So you need to adapt to doing that. And I mentioned the regridding before that I think you cannot have arbitrary refined regions, but rather it's it also done in blocks of eight. And also there is a max grid size in AMREX. If, uh, so in carpet, what carpet does, if there's a large grid, it splits it into pieces to ensure it can be evenly distributed over all processes. AMREX takes a different approach. It just takes all the grids and breaks them up into, well, grids that are by default, I think 32 cubed. And these are then open MP, uh, sorry, MPI parallelized. So there are grids and tiles. Grids are these larger things and you do specify the grid size and these grids are then distributed and the grids are broken into tiles and the tiles are then distributed. So whereas carpet looks at the number of processes and threads and tries to find an ideal distribution for that. Carpet X does it the other way around. There's just the maximum size and then you get chunks and bits and these are distributed. And if it's not efficient, you need to choose smaller grids or smaller tiles. Now the advantage of all of that, now <laughs> just because I'm so proud, I'm actually going to mention that, is I ran some benchmarks with various tiles and grid sizes and so on, on a single node of a particular benchmark. That's uh, Minkowski on 256 cubed and uh, for 10 iteration, the best thing I got was 57 seconds. It gets slower as you go down here. And uh, the interesting thing here is the number of, so the tile size is four by two and so on. And the interesting thing is the number of threads per process, this one here. So the most efficient way of running this particular benchmark in Carpet X is using 10 OpenMP threads per MPI process. And that was always different in carpet in carpet. It was always the case that MPI's parallelization is more efficient than OpenMP. People would not use OpenMP. Only if you hit the, hit the scaling limits when you run on a thousand uh, cores, that's when you switch on OpenMP. But here we can use OpenMP in the beginning. So that alone means that, well, if that particular benchmark holds water, that things should be 10 times more scalable in terms of using number of cores. And that, that I'm, I'm quite happy about that. And uh, yeah, I don't know whether I should show this slide. It's kind of near and dear to my heart, but I also don't want to overrun. I'd rather leave a bit of time of questions. We have um, another. We have another question in chat. Okay. Mm. This is due to the cache locality of having small tile grids to loop over. Yes. Let me go back to tiling. So each tile needs to be. So if you need to have not just a local variable for a grid point, but kind of a local grid function or something, then it's important that you have tiles that are small enough that they fit into the cache. And the way things happen in the Zeta4C implementation is that first all the derivatives are pre-calculated and then the actual right-hand side is evaluated. And that obviously means that after calculating the derivatives, they should stay in the cache until they're needed by the right-hand side. So you need tiles that are small enough. And because cache lines are 64 bytes and there's sim vectorization you can do in this direction, it's most efficient to not tile in the X direction, but in the Y and Z direction, you apparently four by two or two by four is the most efficient one. Two by two is also good, it's not much slower. I mean, what is that percent or something? 1% slower or 8.2 to thereabouts is good for Z or for C. And yes, that is probably cache locality because you can have local variables that span a whole tile. It's also important for hydro when you first calculate fluxes and then take the 
divergence of the fluxes, you don't want to have a flux grid function that you fill because that would be really large and you need to write it back to memory and read it back in. With this setup, you can have a local flux grid function that is only for one tile that is actually more efficient. Mm. Good. About IO, some smaller differences. First, we learned that modifying files after they're written is generally a bad idea because HPC systems are unreliable. If you open an HDF5 file for writing, then, then, then something happens, you run out of queue time, you're out of disk space, you sec fault or something, you lose the whole file. It's actually an unsafe thing to do. So the basic idea here is that each time step data gets written into one file and the next time step into the next file. And also we try to produce as few files as possible because that's more efficient. I mean, you can open a hundred files, but you can't open 10,000 files in one directory. That would not be efficient. Norms go all into one file. TSV, I mentioned it earlier, that that's the new ASCII format. I just call it TSV. It's one file for, per group when it's read by everything. You can open one of these out ASCII output files in Excel. That's actually quite beautiful. I mean, I, I don't know, when I was younger, I hated Excel. But it's quite nice because you see the numbers there, they're nicely formatted. You mark a column and then you can do something there. I mean, that I would use Julia or Python, but you can do it. So why not? Why not use the standard format? And our new HDF5 format is based on silo. This is standard visit format. And uh, there's a reader and a writer for it, but not yet checkpoint and recovery. The metadata are not correctly set up. And it would be straightforward to add a compatibility layer to recreate the old carpet format. And you would just create one additional file that contains all the metadata that the old format requires. And then you add external links to the other file that has the actual data. And there are HDF5 utilities to, to combine files and to split files and to expand links. So if you place a link by actually copy of that object, if you don't like external links and so on, this can, can all be done. Okay, now, oh yes, let's go to the actual source code. Uh, I got carried away, I'm a bit slow in my presentation here. Luckily, it's not that complicated. White choice CPU. There are a few things that are different. I want to briefly go over them. You're probably already familiar with this one, arguments checked. That is one of the things that enables the undefined and const variables, uh, depending on what you declare in the schedule. I highly recommend that, that's the include line. And then when you declare variables, sorry, scroll down to the initial condition here, you write declare arguments, and then the name of the scheduled function instead of declare arguments. Highly recommend that, of course. And then the way to loop over grid functions. So it turns out that if you have vertex-centered and cell-centered grid functions, they have different index bounds, and you need to use a different, a different G of index 3D it needs to be slightly different and so on. And uh, once you have the result of GX index 3D is just a single integer, it's very difficult to do index checking. So there is now a C++ wrapper class that of course is, is very efficient, but which allows you to do index checking in debug mode. Unfortunately, you have to create objects of this thing. I mean, it essentially just wraps the pointer, but you have to do it yourself. There's a bit of point of load. So here you take the value phi and create this wrapper that's called GF phi. I don't care about phi down here. And this wrapper should really be auto-generated. And GF phi is now this thing that behaves like a 3D array in Fortran with index checking and everything. And there's this layout class, which defines a layout with this index type here. So this is now the layout for a cell-centered variable. Everything cell-centered, I'm only needing this layout here. And then if you do something, have a loop, then you set this variable at the index i. So people are used to writing i, j, k every time, but there's really no reason to write i, j, k because the current grid point is always i, j, k. So I use a multi-index with a big i, uppercase i, which corresponds to i, j, k. I'm ascending it to, I don't know, standing wave and so on. And this is the new looping macro, uh, also written in C++. So you loop over the interior this is the index type because you only want to loop over the interior of what corresponds to a cell-centered function. 
and uh, then you use a C++ Lambda and then the point desk is kind of the current point that is executed here. And if you do it like that, it's also in the end easier to convert that into CUDA code. And this point description P contains this multi-index here corresponding to the current grid point. And it also contains X, Y, Z if you need that the current coordinates. I need to calculate that manually. And uh, yeah, I might be going too fast because I feel pressed for time. So if there are questions here, but I guess you just see that this is probably rather easy to read and you could copy that. Let me scroll down a bit to some other function. There is here the boundary function. The setup here is the same thing, but then you have loop bound loop over the boundary of the thing. And that of course is internally six different loops or whatever, depending on the ghost zones and so on, because it loops over all the different boundary faces that are outer boundaries. Uh, then, quick question on that. Is there also planned uh, in that same vein to have arithmetic operators operating on whole grid functions? Like you can multiply, let's say, two grid functions and put in a sort. If you, ah, hmm. I did not plan doing that. It would be straightforward. Actually, Armrex itself uh, supports that. So you could call a function to get the underlying Amrex array for a grid function here and could do it like that. But we could also add the respective operators and whole grid functions. That would probably 20 lines of code or something would be possible. The thing is, if you have a sequence of operations, then it's important that you fuse all the loops and do it in one go. So if you calculate 2x plus 1, you don't want the 2x to kind of return a temporary object and then you loop over that again and add the one. And with that, if you write indices yourself, then it's easier to ensure loop fusion. But uh, if you find the other thing easier to understand, for example, fluxes shift to left, shift to right or something, that would also be possible. Yeah, I was uh, suggesting you start with the expression templates or something, but for example, for initial data performance doesn't matter. So uh, having easier, uh, simpler code is also a good argument to have something like this. Yes, yes. No, no we, could, we could do that. that uh, now I'm getting template of writing that. I, I'm wondering, Eric, uh, I don't know where you are in your presentation. I'm wondering if we want to have uh, a second um, present, I mean, a, a continuation of this at, a, at another call. Do you want to try to do that or do you? Okay. I don't know how so much you have. This is the last thing I'm presenting. After okay. that, I have my final slide. But okay. since this is the first time we're actually looking at the source code, I don't want to rush it either. Uh, I'd be happy to go over time or to continue the presentation at some other time as people want. Mm. Okay, let, let me continue. I want to show you the right-hand side here. And of course, in the right-hand side, so you have phi and psi and there are const here because you have to declare them const because you're not supposed to write to these. That's how the function declared it. The right-hand side variables are not const. So the outer const is just for the wrapper object, for the pointer, so to say, the pointer's const, but the thing pointer to is not const. And then you loop over the interior and then you have this, you have this bug here. Oh no, because there should totally be a zero here. <laughs> Thank you for pointing that out. So this is the current index minus di in the zero direction, in the x direction, in the one direction, in the two direction. There is another syntax where you can write ijk if you prefer that as well. I mean, you could write ijk here and then you write i minus one jk, i plus one jk. I, I'm not quite sure what is easier to understand. I prefer that syntax in more complicated expressions with higher order stencils, but when I show it to when you see it for the first time, it looks a bit overwhelming. And uh, yeah, now you've seen loops. There's loop in, loop boundary. There's probably also a loop all down here. Uh, when you calculate, yeah, when you calculate the error, this loop here, you loop over all points. And the error is that the current stage minus the standing wave at that particular time. <clears throat> Okay, in the interest of time, I shall switch back to the presentation. And uh, yep, stop, last slide. 
So what I think the immediate next step are in the project, first thing is to help others get started. And the big changes that people are facing are probably the schedule clauses that are necessary. The fact that there's no subcycling. So if you have a complicated thing that wants to do special things with adapt and bash refinement, you'd have to stop that. And the loop tiling, which requires that you loop over only a single tile in your scheduled function, not over everything. The loop macros do that correctly anyway. If you are writing your own loops, then you need to look at the tile size and not at the LSH. And uh, big projects, oh, well, implement checkpoint restart. That's the last big feature I'm missing before it's production ready. Obviously, we want to test performance running on 100,000 cores to see whether we can reap the promised benefits and then do some physics with it. And without subcycling in time, it's probably difficult to get something interesting with, uh, say, high spinning black holes because you need a lot of refinement levels that wouldn't be efficient. So maybe something with a relativistic hydrothon. Sounds good. That concludes my presentation. Do you have questions? Mm -hmm. Thank you, Eric. Uh, that was that was great. Um, I'm wondering about you were showing that code just a minute ago with uh, the index type and all that stuff that you were declaring. I'm wondering if that couldn't be generated for, you know, in the declare C C D K arguments macro. It um, it totally should. Yes. Yeah. Uh, one problem there is that you notice I called it G F three D two. There's a yeah. G F three D G F three D two. I'm actually arrived at GF3D5 in the meantime, because the, <laughs> that, that, the design wasn't quite right for CUDA and so on. But I think once we settle to something that is actually nice, it should totally be auto-generated for C++ code. Okay. Do you, so this is, uh, seems to be relying on a lot of C++ features. What do you think is gonna happen with Fortran support and, and the like? I think Fortran support could rather easily be added. Most of the C++ support is necessary because C++ doesn't have 3D arrays built in. So you need to do a lot of stuff yourself. If you have Fortran support, you need to make sure there's an easy way to get the bounds over what something should be iterated. So if there's a function, the function is declared over, say to iterate over a self-centered array, then you need to pass in obviously the, the size of the array, but also the size of the tile over which it should iterate. And then you use the regular Fortran indexing and that, that's all fine. So I mean, oh, I, we myself want... like C++, but I see it's straightforward to keep that. Amrex also has Fortran support, so it's not difficult to add. Mm -hmm. Okay. Eloisa uh, asks if Hydro can, um, oh sh shoot, it just scrolled away from me. Uh... If, if hydro can easily be generated to, can the hydro toy do multi-fluid or can it be easily general, generalized to multi-fluid? So the hydro toy is non-relativistic. It is really just a basic thing. There is, the, everything is linear, as easy as possible. The only thing I experimented with there was with the optimization, the loop tiling, whether that would give us benefit. And yes, yes, it does. And also, of course, refluxing and, and, and so everything everything that works. So it's just testing the Amrex features. There's no physics in there. Uh, easily extending, yes, sure. You just add a few more good functions and so on and it would all work. But really everything is quite primitive in there. Then Ian asks, those are the advantages of Carpet X over pure Amrex. The advantage is that Carpet X comes with the Einstein toolkit and there you have additional things, initial data, horizon finders, and anal analysis modules. If you're quite independent, then you can write your own Amrex based code. You have to, of course, also do some mesh refinement, the regritting, subcycling, and so on yourself, your own time integrator, but uh, it's certainly feasible. Mm. Okay. Uh, sorry, but Ooh, the horizon that... finder would also have to be adjusted to the new framework, right? So I cannot just combine an AMRX uh, simulation with the current horizon finder that uses plain carpet, or can I? To my knowledge, the existing horizon finder should work. I haven't tested it though, which probably means it doesn't work, but uh, there's no, no, nothing big missing. 
the Ryzen finder only needs interpolation and interpolation is supported. And thanks to the work of, of uh, Holland, help me, who, who, who did the? Samka. Thank you. Uh, it even supports the, the correct interface, the interface that AH finder direct expects. Then so that would then probably also hold for weight scalar for decomposition and stuff like that that relies only on interpolation? Uh, the, I don't know. The regular weight scalar calculation does it for every grid point. So you need to update the loops there. And uh, But for wave extraction, we could just extract on a sphere and do something there. That should also work. Mm. So word God. of caution. So a lot of, some of this is planned. I think the support for the interpolator that Sam has added is probably missing bits. I don't think you can quite get the horizon. Well, maybe you can get the horizon finder to work um, because it relies on derivatives and God knows what else. That's not implemented. Hmm? Yeah, I'm not sure if you have the hookup. Ah, you think the hookup is not, not there. It, it might be there was a bit of a kludge. Um, but in principle, the idea is that that is one of the things that should be supported to just take over because it really doesn't depend on the grid. Give it a try, see what happens. Okay. I'm going to continue with the comments. Gabriele says, everything I know about the Einstein toolkit is because there are examples. They have a lot of documentation and examples. Yes. So I just, this wave toy CPU thorn actually realized yesterday there was no simple example. So I took one of the existing wave toys, simplified it, called it wave toy CPU and just pushed it to the repository this morning. That was the one way I just fixed the bug. The derivatives were wrong. So clearly knitted with a hot needle, but uh, yes, that is there. And I also hope <clears throat> that as others begin to use it, others help us with these testing and uh, with writing examples and documenting examples and so on. Uh, Ian says, Cactus provides higher level extractions than ARM regs. Definitely, Cactus has all these interface CCL. You say, this is my state vector. These are my right-hand side variables. This is the boundary condition function. And in ARM regs, you say, well, let me call this particular function that expects these parameters. And then I restrict from course to fine grid and all the checking of grid functions and consistencies and so on, nothing of that is there. So essentially, I'd say half the work that we did to write Carpet X, you'd have to redo. Carpet X is generic, so maybe you don't care about hydro, you only want a black hole. You can skip all the work on cell-centered functions, but uh, if you want to have a real full evolution code, then you'd have to redo a lot of things that you did with Carpet X. Multiple while scale four was the highest find a differencing order attempted for the set of C and carpet X prolongation order. Uh, I believe we have generic stencils and the stencils are just essentially a table. I don't know up to what order, maybe eight, maybe 11. I like it if things go up to 11. Zeta for C currently <laughs> runs with fourth order, but that's just one define in the beginning. And oh yeah, I don't think the eighth order stencils are in the code, but that would be again, just three or four lines. I mean, you need a first derivative, second derivative and respective dissipation operators, upwinding operator. Okay, it's 10 lines that you need to get higher orders. And uh, the prolongation restriction order, that's what provided by carpet X. They are quite high order. I don't recall where the limit is, but you can also extend that up there. Mm. Uh, does Armrex have Python bindings to post produce 3D AMR data? I don't know what you mean. So the file format can be read if that's what you mean, but you probably want to have a kind of a connection to NumPy. You have the NumPy stuff in Python and then Armrex does the calculations there. And of course, NumPy has a race and Armrex has a whole grid hierarchy. That would be cool. Been I don't know if AMREX has th things like reduction operators or interpolation operators. Uh, one could, uh, even if it's just a CAP, one could call from within Python. Uh, that would probably simplify writing post-processing libraries a lot. Because that was the awful thing in Carpet that one had to uh, rewrite the whole uh, AMR loading in Python again, which is also error prone. Okay, I completely agree. This is really important. 
we made some half-hearted attempts. Well, I don't think it was half-hearted, but we made some attempts, but eventually we failed because it was too difficult. I think right now that uh, Carpet X is still in a young stage, we should try to do that. I don't know whether AMREX is the right point because we have higher, more high level information. The way we use AMREX, basically AMREX only knows about refinement levels and operators between the refinement levels. We don't actually ever tell AMREX about the whole grid hierarchy. Because if we do that, then there's no good ways to shoehorn our own time evolution mechanism in there. And uh, so maybe Carpet X should have respective things. Uh, I wonder how that would work. Maybe we need to start it up as a server and then it takes requests. Eloisa was working on that and uh, the connection with Visit to have a Visit backend engine running there. And uh, that in the end was not a very good idea. I mean, that, I, I think there was some miscommunication with the Visit designers that they were not actually actively working on it. Sorry, on the visit side, that was just not not developed too much as a proof of concept and they left it at that, so it was really not very functional. Okay. Well, so I one example would be our friends in the movie industry developed this open VDB library, which is also uh, unstructured grid. Uh, and there you, you have really nice Python bindings. I actually used that in ray tracing uh, cactus data so if Carpet X would be sort of a library that is called in Einstein Toolkit and can also be called from outside. Is that yes. possible? Yeah, the problem is that Cactus is a framework and it really likes to be in control of things. So calling Carpet X like a library, because Carpet X depends on the flash on Cactus for various things and Cactus really wants to be a framework. I think the easiest thing might be you start a, cactus thingy in the end, but it doesn't do time evolution, but you just tell it to read some grid functions, get a grid structure there. And uh, then it just sits in a tight loop waiting for requests from the outside. And you have kind of a generic analysis storm that waits for a request from Python and then does the respective operation, adding, subtracting, using, interpolating. That should be possible. And then when you want to load a new grid structure, you'd have to restart that server. So it's not ideal, but what I just described would be relatively straightforward to implement. Is someone taking notes? This is a really good idea. We should put that, we should put that on a to-do item, at least explore it further and then see, see why it doesn't work. But I think it should. We're recording, so that counts. Oh, okay. Something about CUDA and accelerators. Yes, AMREX supports accelerators. There's progress every month. There's, of course, CUDA. There are other things. There's OpenCLs and other frameworks that are being developed. It's not yet quite clear whether there's a framework that works everywhere. At the moment, I'm sad that my Mac laptop doesn't support CUDA because it doesn't have an NVIDIA graphics card. It has a graphics card, but I can't use it. And uh, so, mentioned briefly earlier, what we did in the past week, we looked at accelerator support. And there is another thorn that looks very similar to WaveDry CUDA. A few small changes. It still runs basically with the same efficiency on a CPU, but it also runs on a GPU in the sense it runs reasonable there, gives correct results. The performance probably isn't ideal because if you want to run performant on a GPU, you need to have different tiling sizes, different grid sizes. And most importantly, you need to make sure that all the calculations ha hand happen on a GPU, so that including synchronization and prolongation. And those stencils, the ones that CarpetX uses, are all executed on the CPU. So it's done a lot of copying forth and back. I think even a time integrator probably wants to do stiff stuff on a CPU. But that can all be added. But as a proof of concept, it works. We can run the Einstein equations on a GPU. But performance is not there yet. And I'm, I'm happy that the same code runs efficiently on a CPU and reasonably on a GPU. So if you write a code and follow the usual coding guidelines, then you would have a code that should run on a GPU kind of usably, but not in production out of the box. And, and that is actually something pretty cool. 
sickle, sickle. Yes, yes, I looked into sickle, hip sickle, and so on. And uh, I don't recall. Many of these things work beautifully on Linux, but then I want to compile it on Mac, so there's a death part. So I haven't found a good thing yet. Mm. The repository for Carpetex, everything is the same repository. And uh, Roland put the URL into the email announcement. It's on Bitbucket somewhere, but let me just post it in here until Roland beats me to it. Oh, it's not called Carpet X, it's called Cactus Umrex. That makes it difficult to find. That's the URL, everything's public. Up until a week ago, there was a big CUDA branch that's now been merged. That's what I mentioned. So the all the development happens on the main branch, the master branch there. So with carpet, sometimes one needs uh, internals because there's lacking functionality. For example, I'm making histograms and I use a carpet weight. Is there a similar concept in AMREX uh, with the weights of um, <clears throat> finite volume cells? Uh, if I want to integrate over the whole grid something, that is not just the grid function. So there are weights. And obviously, if you use a cell-centered thing, the weight is just the cell volume. Cells are easy to integrate. And for vertices, there are also weights. I don't know whether they're stored or calculated. So the point being not counting the same cell twice because it's uh, once in a course and once on a final. Yes, yes, yes. So the coarse grid points would have a weight of zero if there's a fine grid point. And at the boundary between the coarse and fine grid, you want to count the coarse grid by one half and the fine grid by one half. I mean, one kind of the left contribution towards the coarse grid, the other one, the right contribution towards the fine grid. So that thing is there as well. I don't know whether it's a grid function that can be output. Okay. Is there a getting started tutorial? Yes, there is. It's been recorded. As soon as this recording stops, you have your tutorial. <laughs> no, I'm sorry. Uh, this is the first time we're starting with tutorials like that. Before that, it was really quite technical. But if someone wants to help us make a tutorial, that would be much appreciated. Mm. Mm. Now, in this talk, I'm mainly we mainly discussed how to do things in an abstract, but it's not hands-on. One big problem, obviously, is that you have to compile AMREX yourself if you want to, as an external library. I don't think that happens automatically yet. So we thought about at some point having a tutorial that is more hands-on, where people write their own code, and then of course the real questions come up and run their things and look at output, where we can also discuss that. So I'd be happy to schedule that at some other point. It could be this time slot, or if you want to have more time, could be at another time slot. Let us know on the mailing list. Mm -hmm. Are there other questions, comments? Mm -hmm. So you mentioned this uh, mole replacement. Is that, uh, uh, sorry, mole, not mole. Uh, is that uh, a, I am a um, carpet X thing, or is this also for regular carpet? And if yes, uh, is there some uh, description somewhere? So this thing is called ODE solvers. It's in the same repository uh, as the Carpet X arrangement. And at the moment, it's tied to Carpet X and to AMREX because it wants to allocate temporary grid functions. That was always a bit unclean in MOL with time levels and allocating something. And here it just asks for temporary storage for grid functions and releases that afterwards. And that, of course, makes everything simple. Also, the loop looping doesn't handle it, have an in the schedule anymore. It happens in C++ code. You can call schedule groups from, from C code. Carpet, uh, sorry, Cactus supports that. And that means the whole code is much simpler. And I think there's even the generic thing there that handles arbitrary butcher tableaus. And then you put your numbers in there, and then you get an eighth order room cutter. It's not quite efficient if you hand code it, then you can release some storage of them unneeded right hand sides earlier. At the moment, it doesn't do that yet, but that's that. And there's also, at some point, we wanted to look at the IMAX integrators, implicit, explicit. 
So a few methods are implemented there. It's not difficult. You just put your tableaus and so on. But I don't think we actually properly tested them. In particular, a convergence test whether things are correct to second or third order. I no, I don't want to say that. I'm sure Roland tested them. He's always very careful about that. He wrote do the have, test. Yeah, we had to have convergence tests They're actually in the soft tests. Okay. And so what I would have liked is a convergence test with an analytic solution. And I wasn't able to construct something. I mean, where I kind of predict what the IMAX thing does actually. So that doesn't exist. But a convergence test in the sense of a self-convergence test, these are in there. Wait, IMAX? No, IMAX I didn't test, I'm sorry. Pardon? IMAX I didn't test, I'm sorry. I only tested the ODE solver itself. OK. Well, so it, it should be the same kind of thing, right? You just have two right-hand sides, implicit and explicit. It should converge the same thing. But it's difficult. That one I've tested, yes. Yeah, yeah. OK. So backporting these ODE solvers to carpet. It, it would be difficult because carpet doesn't have the idea of grid functions on the fly. It wouldn't be difficult to add, but it, it's not there yet. Uh, do you have more questions? Okay, and in this case, I apologize going over time. I should have anticipated these kind of questions and kind of shortened my presentation. I, I try to be quite explicit about the features that are not yet supported because I don't want to fool you. And I also wanted to have slides where I describe the details of where things change between Carpet and Carpet X. And that was a bit more material than I anticipated. Mm. Uh, I think it's great. I was expecting it to go over. I don't know what other people yeah. were expecting. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> All right, well, thank you, thank you, Eric, uh, for for this. This is this was really great. You're most welcome. Yes, yes, it was. Thank you. Okay, so I'll.